cool, man. We're live. You want to hold it? We're ready. Whenever you pull up your app and it shows like whatever the Amiibo's connected to and it says stream via Wi Fi, connect, press that, and it should like bring up that one page where it had all the different connections on there. And uh, if he's got his hotspot on, it'll be up at the very top. Click on his hotspot. I tried to turn him to his phone right there, but he wanted to charge Wi Fi first and then it kept moving out. Yeah, I told him it you know, when I pull up and he sees me, just turn on his hotspot on his phone. All right. <laughs> Real quick. Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like a hot second. Yeah. Well, we just want to welcome you guys out. Uh, go with the gospel, night one. We had an awesome time this morning. We had some training. And we had three teams that went out in the community. We got to love on some folks in the community. And that's what it's all about. Amen. Amen. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that world crest of the devil. And by the way, two thirds of God is a go. Let me say that again. Two thirds of God is go. Amen. And God wants us to get outside of the four walls of the building and not just do church, but be the church. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm not preaching tonight. My brother Blake is ultimately going to be up and preach, but we got a couple good testimonies before that. And we also have some dynamic worship. But before we do that, I want to get a couple testimonies from today, from when we went out. Just a couple three-minute testimonies from today when we went out. Does anybody want to jump up? Come on. So today we got to go through the neighborhood and um, do the stuff. We got to heal the sick. And there was a precious lady that was, um, there were two ladies on their, de on their front deck. They were just minding their own business. And so we're like, hey, so God loves you. And um, I've seen people you know, be healed and their pain removed when I prayed for them. So we're going to pray for you. And um, <laughs> I got to pray with one lady and she said she had lower back pain. And so we prayed, and she said it felt better because we asked her to check it out. And then we prayed again because it wasn't 100%. And then um, I think it was the third time that we prayed. Um, she started kind of doing this little dance around her porch. And she was like, I've been hurting so long, but it feels good now. So we just praise the Lord for that. And then her friend, who was um, on the porch as well, um, she, she had fibromyalgia and, and a lot of pain. And so we prayed over her and she felt the peace and the love and the presence of God. And she knew that she had been touched and encountered by the Lord that day. So Amen. thank you for that. Amen. Awesome. awesome. I'm looking at Sean and I'm looking at Matt. Who's got something? Who else has got something? One of y'all got something? That was there. That was that one. Yeah. Matt, you got something? Something else that we did today? Does anything stand out? We had a good um, one of the ladies that we prayed with who were just able to speak into her life and you could just tell she'd been through some stuff and I believe the Holy Spirit just came down and began to minister to her and remind her of what God was really calling her into. And she had a moment with the Lord, I believe. So a lot of times when you when you speak a word, it's released in seed form. And but that is the word of God, so it goes to work. And the word of God, the Bible says, the word of God doesn't return void, but it will accomplish everything that you send it out to do. So it might not happen in that moment, but the word of God never sleeps and it never slumbers. So even when they're laying down and, and, and they're they're chilling out, that word is still inside of them and it's working and it's shaking things up on the inside of them. It's waking things up on the inside of them. So really cool time, and um, we're going to do it again tomorrow. So if anybody wants to come out and join us tomorrow at 10 a.m., we're going to do some more training and then we're going to go out in the highways and byways like we're called to do as part of the, part of the Great Commission. So everybody's welcome to come and join us. We're going to have a lot of fun. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be having a cookout and a two-hour music set. So if you want to come out for some free hamburgers and hot dogs, fellowship, outreach, Please come out tomorrow. Everything is free. So we are going to give people a chance to sow. If you want to sow into um, this weekend 
Freedom Worship Center. We're going to split it up with Freedom and Able. So if you want to sow into the event, that's what it's going to go into. So we're going to have these up here. We're not going to do an actual offering call, but it will be up here. If you want to come up anytime and donate, you can. So Hey, Pastor, can you open us up in prayer? This is Pastor Campbell, guys. He's the pastor of Freedom Worship Center. Just want to honor the man of God and uh, his wife, Ms. Campbell. And uh, he's going to open us up in prayer. And then after that, we're going to turn it over to Matt, who is actually his son, Matt Campbell over here. So. Hey, man. <laughs> you might not know it, huh? <laughs> yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this night, Lord. Uh, Lord, this is your service, Lord. This is your revival, Lord. And, and Lord, we're looking for you to show up tonight, Lord, and show out and just to touch and to heal and let, let the Holy Spirit go out into the community, Lord, and draw them unto you, Lord. Let the music soak in, Lord. Let the word soak in, Lord. Lord, we're looking for something miraculous to happen this weekend, Lord. This is all for you, Lord, in reaching the lost, Lord. Lord, and, and healing those that are sick and those that are wounded, Lord, those that are hurt, Lord, whatever it is they're going through, Lord, we're here to be your hands and your feet and to carry that love. We ask, Lord, that you anoint each and every one that sings and, and the one that speaks tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus name, amen. amen. All right. We ready.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
It's kind of like a staple for mine. Uh, talks about the reckless love of God. Does anybody know anything about that? No. Okay, so one of the things the Holy Spirit's really been talking to me about lately, honestly, is uh, brokenness. Because I used to be broken. Um, and my experience makes me an expert. And uh, one of the things that God's saying to me, I can see in this community, in a lot of places, you know, there's a lot of broken people. And one thing that the Holy Spirit said to me is, I did not break you to hurt you, I broke you to save you because your prayers were too big. I'm trying to position you in a place where I can work in your life, and the only way I can do that is when you come to the end of yourself. Because it says God is self, right? His love just, it's ridiculous when you think about it. From human terms, it don't make no sense, does it? All the glory be to Him, right? Before I spoke, been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. How the overwhelming ever
testimonies and then Blake's going to come up. I want to share something. I shared this with the guys this morning and I, and I think it's powerful and I think it it's a right now word. Um, I was watching any of you guys ever watch It's Supernatural with Sid Roth? Y'all ever seen that? Pretty cool show. Um, who's heard of Smith Wigglesworth out here? Smith Wigglesworth. Pioneer of faith. Like Raised so many people from the dead, it's not even funny. Um, it's crazy. He started out as a stutterer. He was a plumber. He was, he was afraid to talk in front of people. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the rest was history. Come on. Just did great exploits for the Lord. Well, his great-granddaughter was on Sid Roth, and I'll just give it to you, and give you the honey, because it was the whole show was good, but I'll give you the honey. She was sharing different events that Smith had prophesied that had come to pass. There was a couple of them. And she finished with this. She said, and everything that he said, everything that he spoke about that was going to pass has come to pass. And the last thing that he mentioned that was going to happen before Jesus returned was she said people were going to give their testimonies. People were going to share their stories. Let me say that again. Prior to Jesus' return, one of the last moves of God was going to be people telling their testimonies. Amen. People sharing their stories. So those clouds could pop up at any time, right? Because we're going to be giving some testimonies Amen. tonight. Amen? Amen? Our testimonies are actually a weapon. You know, Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Yes. Right? It doesn't stop there. It says, and they love not their own life unto death. Amen. So laying our life down for the king creates a testimony. And the Bible says also in Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, whatever, when we go out and we testify, and even the testimonies tonight, listen, the word of God says in, in Psalm 119, verse 111, that the testimonies of our God are our inheritance forever. That means whatever God did for whoever stands in front of you this weekend, he'll do for you. Whatever you've seen God do in the word, that's available to you. You can take hold of it by faith. Amen. So I want to get our faith level high this weekend. I want to get our expectation up there. There's also a draw, guys. Listen to me. When you get in faith and you get locked in with what God's doing, you're going to draw from whoever's up here sharing. So I want you to get your faith levels up real high this weekend. Amen. All right. So we got a couple shorter testimonies yeah, and then blake's gonna finish the night up with a word the lord's been ministering a word to him and i can't wait to hear it i'm excited about it but the first guy that i'm gonna call up is one of my best friends dustin adair come on up get it dustin we yeah, work together buddy. by the way you're all my best friends man. but we work together every day we work side by side and i'll say this faithful consistent you can count on them and I'm just glad that the Lord brought him to Abel and now that we're able to be on the same team and work together side by side. It's definitely been an honor. He's got a powerful story and a powerful testimony. Later on, I believe that we'll hear more of the story. Tonight, we're gonna to get kind of a condensed version, but this man's got so much inside of him, it's not even funny. So without further ado, Dustin the Dare. All right, Dustin. Hey, uh, uh I don't think my story is much different than a lot of y'all out here. And, uh, God's still in the miracle business. That's 100% right. Amen. Right. Um, my parents separated when I was like six. Uh, we moved to Oplaka, so I was in a single parent home. 
we were poor, I was overweight, and I was a minority in my neighborhood. Um, that didn't lend much to self-esteem, and that turned into a lot of mental health issues when I was young. Uh, had high anxiety, depression. Uh, I battled with suicidal thoughts and a couple of attempts when I was young. And so gradually I started seeking love in all the wrong places and it's easy to fall in with the wrong crowd. By the time I was 12, I was using gateway drugs. By the time I was 17, I was on the harder drugs. Um, and I was uh, I was also selling them and that kind of lended to my self-esteem. I thought I had a lot of friends and stuff and they weren't around when I didn't have drugs. Mm -hmm. By 2013, I had two kids, and uh, by the ways of the world, I was doing well. Um, and I had some health problems come along, so I couldn't work. And so I turned back to my old ways, and I started selling drugs again. Um, and it was just a, it was a mess, as far as control. Uh, in 2014, I tried rehab for the first time. I was there for about two months, and uh, the guy that raised me died. And I hit the ground running. Um, by 2016, I was in and out of jail. I was in jail about as much as I was out of jail. Um, I'd been indicted for a couple of charges and I was on the run. And, uh, 2019, um, I just got out of jail and uh, it, was, it was real bad at the time. And uh, I remember thinking I didn't really have a lot to, to live for. And uh, I'd heard on the radio about somebody putting on a career show for uh, people with bad backgrounds and uh, felonies and stuff like that. And his last name was Van Dusseldorf. It was a real uh, unique last name. And uh, me and a girl were sitting side by side and she said, uh, she just got out of jail for some charges and she said, we need to pray about this. And what she prayed was that we would get off drugs together. What I prayed was that she wouldn't die in my bed. And at the time that was the most selfish prayer I probably ever said, but it's all I could think of. Well, about five minutes after we said that, Joshua Van Dusen will message me on Facebook about fixing a generator. Yeah. And uh, basically last name had been anything else. There's really no time where I would be right now. Um, but he sent me to a place in Anderson called the Center of Hope. And it's, uh, and it's hard to describe the Jesus that's in that place. It's more love than you'll ever feel in your life. Um, it's structured very well. They put me in the right place at the right time. Uh, stuck by me through all of it. And uh, the charges that I had were pretty serious. And when I got out of the center, <laughs> Um, I had a couple of letters from it. I went in front of the judge, and uh, I reported twice on two distribution charges, and they let me out scot free. I ended up back at April. I, I work for Josh Lee's ministry now. Um, and when I was at the Center of Hope, I read a verse one time. It was in Romans 7. It said, Who can save a wretch like me? And I could really identify with that. Um, and Jesus, Jesus done it. Um, in Isaiah 38, 1 through 22, um, Isaiah has come to Hezekiah and told him to get your affairs in order. He's got a word from the Lord that he's going to pass away. And Isaiah turns his face to the wall and he says, uh, you know, I'm in the prime of my life. I've been faithful. You know, why would you do this, basically? And God sends Isaiah back and says, you got 15 more years. And um, what, Isaiah, what Hezekiah said was, uh, this anguish was good for me because the dead can't praise God. And that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, like I said, I, had, I went through a lot when I was a kid. I went through a lot as an adult. But uh, since Christ came into my life, man, I'm, I'm a new creation. I don't have any of those thoughts anymore. I have no temptation to use drugs. I actually work for a place to help guys get what I got and lead them to the feet of Jesus. Um, I've been delivered from addiction. I've been delivered from the legal system. Um, the love I sought for, I'm surrounded with. Man. I work with a bunch of great people, and it's awesome. <laughs> Um, but most of all, Jesus loved me and he saved me. Um, and if anybody of y'all, if any of y'all, if y'all know anybody's looking for help, get in contact with us. Amen. Amen. Awesome, awesome, good, good testimony, bro. Real quick, before we bring up um, Matt Campbell, I was just notified that um, somebody in the community, their daughter needs prayer. Her name is Pella with a P, not Bella, Pella. And she's got a heart condition. So her heart was beating very fast. And they, I guess they had to take her to the hospital. So he reached out to us and requested prayer. So real quick, let's lift up Pella in prayer, okay? As a, as a community. So Father God, right now, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we lift up Pella. We speak 
healing and wholeness over her wherever she's at, Lord. We pray that you would just touch her, the great physician, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healed, healeth thee. And we just send your word right now to he to bring healing. We pray that you would give comfort to Pella and also the parents, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you in advance. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Next, I'm going to call up Matt Campbell. You know, I was going to write some stuff down and about my testimony, but you might look at the house right behind me. Two years ago, I was homeless. I went to open that house, carrying all that in my mind. Didn't know which way to go. Didn't know where to do. And I'm going to say something out of Romans 7 also, Dustin. First of all, I grew up a child of a pastor, an evangelist. I knew right from wrong, but I chose the acceptance of the world instead of the acceptance of God. I learned to find my identity in the world, and what that got me was searching for all the wrong things and all the wrong places, doing God knows what, and I, well, I was ruining my family. I, was, I became a horrible father. I lost everything from my business all the way down to my livelihood. I couldn't even go back home to my mom and dad, and he would say, well, your dad's a pastor. Well, I broke so many forms of trust in that household. God told him not to let me come back in that household for a reason. Because me being in there, he wouldn't even have his house under control, because I was that out of control. So I was out here in the wintertime two years ago, walking up and down these streets, nobody, nothing, asking God, like, God, I want to change, I want to do this, but I can't do it because the sin that lives in me. And this brings me to a verse in Romans chapter seven, well, I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. And if I do what I do not want, I'm no longer the one that does it, but it's the sin that lives in me. You get so far wrapped up in sin, I mean, you, have, you, have, you don't have control over anyone has control over you. And I was, I was uh, addicted to methamphetamines and heroin for 10 out of the last 15 years. I'd OD'd on the same street and around the corner four times in this area 10 times total that year i shouldn't be here i should be another statistic i should my parents should be visiting me at the at the graveyard now instead of seeing me face to face but luckily there's a loving god and a praying mother that got me here because i was arrested february 11th five minutes for my mother's birthday <laughs> And I called, I was like, Mom, this is it. And I've never been more happy to go to jail. I was, it's like the closer you get, the closer you get to death, you can feel both kingdoms pulling at you. Yeah. I mean, I've never felt, but I, I was listening more to the, the kingdom of the enemy than the kingdom of God. But I felt, I, I can't explain it, but the pull I felt in my soul and in my spirit was out of this world. And I knew something was coming. It was either... I was going to die, or there was going to be an encounter. And that encounter was some blue lights in Columbus, Georgia, and eight months in the county. Not being able to get the, uh, the Center of Hope. That was a five month process. Remember, Chris? You know, like the DA was like, no, 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 he's going to stay here. He's going to do this. We want to up his bond. We want to give him this traffic and charge back. We want to send him to prison for five years or whatever. And I was like, no, I'm rebuking that. You know, but I told God, I was like, listen, God, if you get me to the Center of Hope, I'm going to give you 150%. <laughs> Rock Awards here. He was my a boss in the kitchen there. <laughs> it was a good year. It was a good year. Uh, but I gave. I, I would like to thank you know. I put the best foot forward with God, and uh, He's met me in the middle every time. You know, He says that He's going. He's going to give you back what the enemy stole. And it's true. You know, now I've got my. I've got my family back. I've got. I've got a. I got a sound mind. If you would have told me a couple years ago I would have a sound mind, if I would be standing out with saying you're crazy and go on somewhere because I just wouldn't accept it, I wouldn't have believed it, and that was it. I accepted my faith that God had other plans. So if there's anybody in the community in this area that said, if you don't understand, I understand. I was there. I know what time it is already, but I know the God that can meet you today and he can change your life. Amen. Praise God. Well, without further ado, I know we're running out of time. I'll call up Blake. Blake and I actually met in 2013. I think he had just done like five years in the state. I was just finishing up my federal bid. And uh, we met up and we've been running for Jesus ever since. So it's an honor to, uh, just like the other guys, it's an honor to serve and labor and run with this man of God. And we did the jail ministry together. Um, it's seasonal, but... 
when we can get in there together, we get in there together and we we're able to share our testimonies to encourage a lot of folks and really make an impact. So I'm grateful for this man of God and I'm excited to hear what he's got to say this evening. Amen. 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 Let me find out my how hot I am on this mic so it might take me a minute. Because yeah. I'm a hard preacher, so I get loud. All right. We're good. Y'all good? Amen. 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 Well, when Chris messaged me, he said, uh, he kind of gave me my sermon. A lot of times you don't get that. They just say, hey, give me what you, give, the, give, uh, give what the Lord gives you. But Chris said he wanted to keep it on the basis of evangelism, going out, and uh, testimony. And that's kind of the vein. And I can stand here like Matt, the guy that went before him, and share pretty much the same testimony. And I'll share briefly how I met the Lord and just some key points on the last 12 years and kind of the momentum it takes to keep walking with God. And so I see myself and a lot of you guys, especially the ones that are in the program, uh, I wasn't lucky enough to get a program, never. Uh, I went to the county jail over 40 times, went to prison twice, and uh, my they just never gave me a program. I put in for it, got accepted to them, but for whatever reason, I never got a, a program bid. So I always had to do county or, or jail time. And so, I, will, I was raised right here in Phoenix City. I ran up and down these streets and uh, played baseball at Central. And I went to college on a baseball scholarship, graduated in 2001. But by the time I was 13, I was already doing dope. And so I was smoking weed and drinking beer. I was taking X pills by the time I was 15, uh, doing cocaine by the time I was 16, eating shrooms at 17, 18. I got up into ice and phosphorus and anhydrous meth around the time I was 19. I never did downers. That was one thing that kind of, I just never was a downer type person, right? If I had homeboys that did downers and they nodded off, they were probably getting robbed. So I always kind of kept that in mind and just always locked on the cocaine or, or ice. But anyway, got arrested for the first time when I was 18. Got, a, got arrested actually the first time when I was 16, but it didn't count because I was a juvenile. I got a DUI, totaled out a car. The first real case came when I was 18. I got arrested for possession with intent to distribute. Uh, I had seven blunts in my pocket. Metro narcotics agents were watching the house that I just happened to be in at the time. They kicked the door in. I was there. Got put on three years probation. Um, never did report to a PO, a court referral officer, nobody. And so got put on a probation revocation. Did my first bid in the county jail. Did one month and I learned a lot in that bid. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a small guy. I've always been around 6'4". When I was on dope, I was around 170. Anytime I've been sober, I've been around 215. And I learned real quick, not that I could fight, it's just that fighting wasn't an issue. Um, it just, you know, you move faster than he does and you hit him harder than he hits you. And so I came out of the county jail a little harder than when I first went in. And I, I violated the second time, went back and did two months and uh, got out, violated the third time the judge gave me the remainder of my three years probation in prison for the first time. So I went down the road in prison for the first time in Alabama. I was 21 years old, about to be 22. I did 15 months at Kilby Permanent Party. Same thing happened. I go in there and I tell people all the time, prison is like LinkedIn for inmates because I can't, I went in there just a 21 year old white kid from the North end of Phoenix city who had good parents who were throwing money at every case I ever had, all my clothes, all my cars. And so when I came out of prison, I remember, consciously making a decision in my mind that if I go out here and do dope again, sell dope, run the streets, that's the worst they can do to me. Like the state had just pulled their trump card. Prison is all they had. And prison was a network for me. I met dudes out of Birmingham, out of Florida, out of Texas, out of Tennessee, out of Colorado. So obviously I made that decision. You know what? I'm gonna go sell more dope and run the streets because prison wasn't that bad. Some guys have it tough in there. I don't know, I'm just a people person. Prison was never hard for me. The county jail was never tough for me. I, if Most of y'all know me, if I see you, I talk. I probably talk too much. I've always been a people person. So I get out after doing 15 months. I make that decision. I'm with a good friend of mine, Tona Parker. She's dead now. She died of a heroin overdose, but I'm with her about six months later. And we're running through Casita and highway patrol gets behind us. And I got an eight ball of dope on me and I throw it out the window. We hit the top of the hill. We swip, uh, swipe switched seats in the car, but the highway patrol saw that it was me driving. So he walked up to my side of the car and he told me, he said, you know, son, you might've got away with it if you didn't have that hot pink polo on. When you topped the hill, you were driving. When I pulled the car over, now you're in the passenger seat. 
So I did six months in Muskogee County, right? Got out after doing six months and I was out for three months and I called it trafficking and manufacturing in a second. I go back in front of Judge Green, it's my fourth class A felony and he sentences me to two 15 year sentences running concurrent um, Department of Corrections. I go to prison the second time, I'm 25 years old. I'm not a gang member at this time. I'm not an intravenous drug user at this time. I'm just a white kid from the north side of town that like to party with my parents' money, right? But I get to prison, my athletic ability, my people skills opened up the door for me. I was only white boy on the basketball court. I played volleyball, I played softball. I navigated through a prison real easy. I was a networker. I was a, I'm almost kind of like a politician, a, a bureaucrat. Not that I know how to talk to you to get what I want, but I'm never e uneasy in a room. Some people just don't have confidence. I want to tell you, if you're one of those people, you don't have natural God-given confidence, he's going to give it to you. It's one of the things he does. I had confidence, but it was dark, you know? And so I went to prison that second time. And um, like I said, I wasn't raised to be a gang member or even a drug dealer. On the third year of that prison bid though, I started putting a needle in my arm for the first time. I was scoring ice through a, a certain police officer that was bringing it in. And if you guys that's ever done dope in, in prison or dope in general, it's, it's kind of hard to smoke dope or snort dope in prison. So I started putting a needle in my arm and I went to about 171 pounds. And I got to the point where Matt said, um, I didn't have a regard for life. I was so ashamed of myself and embarrassed at what my life had become. My girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, was Miss Phoenix City. I was the number one uh, rated junior college freshman uh, pitcher in the nation. <laughs> Uh, the college baseball team that I was on, we were number three in the nation. We went 49 and nine my freshman year. I was so ashamed of who I had become. Now I'm sitting in prison on essentially the fifth year and I'm putting a needle in my arm and Facebook is out and I'm watching all the people I grew up with. They're graduating from Auburn. They're graduating from Alabama. They're getting mortgages. They're buying cars. Their wives are having their first baby. And so I would look at those pictures on Facebook and it would, it would kind of tick me off for a minute, but the self-hatred would just say, do another shot. And I would do another shot and I would get numb and I would do the whole prison thing and run around and gang bang, but it was really just a, a way to escape. It was a way to escape the reality that I had created for myself. So I had a lot of self-hate. I wouldn't have told you that. Like, if you hate yourself, I'd be like, no, I'm straight, I'm good with me. But I really did. And I see that a lot in people often. One of the first things I see is a lack of confidence and self-condemnation. And the antidote to self-condemnation though is sonship. Realizing who you are in God. I know you people are able, you hear that a ton. You hear identity and sonship, identity, sonship. But it's a revelation. It's a revelation. And the Apostle Paul speaks about it in Galatians 4. He says, The son differs nothing than the, from the servant as long as he's in the father's house until the time appointed by the father. Sonship is a revelation. You can hear sonship all you want to, but until it hits your heart and you realize that you're a son of God, you won't fully grasp it. And so sonship is the antidote to condemnation. Well, anyway, let me backtrack a little bit. So I, I had a lot of self-hate. And so I was where Matt was, I did not care if I lived or died. I would put a needle in my arm, I would pull it back, and I would try, not saying I'm committing suicide, but I'd be like kind of daring God, let's see what you got. And I would cry out to God, where are you at? I'd be in lockup cells seven, 14 days where it's, it's 10 by eight cells and it's so quiet back there, you can hear the lights humming on the top of the ceiling and your six metal doors from any human. And I would ask God, if you're real, speak to me. I would get real quiet as I could in my cell lockup. And I would say, if you're real, say something. And I would get quiet and try to listen. Then he wouldn't say nothing. Then I'd get mad and I'd throw my Bible against the wall. And I'd call God all kind of names, you know, just crazy names. And then I'd stand there like Lieutenant Dan saying, if you're so big and you're so, you so, your God wants you to kill me then. And it'd be silence and I'd get madder, Right. And so I lived like that for the first three years in prison on that second bid. And I did not care if I lived or died. I stood in front of boys in gang fights and they'd come out of their prison pants with lawnmower blades. They'd been sharpened in the hobby craft. Did not care. April 22nd of 2012, though, I woke up to nine guards around my bunk. And I thought it was just another raid. They were coming to get a cell phone or they were coming to look over my stuff for contraband. But I was on what's called a C-51 lateral transfer. And that's when they essentially you've done so much time in, a, in one prison institution in the state of Alabama and you've caused so much turmoil in that camp. They C-51 you out of there and they swap you out with another inmate across state. And it's just a lateral transfer. And that was April 22nd of 2012. And I remember thinking, I'm good as long as I don't go to Easterling. 
right? Because Eastling, out of 33 institutions in the state, is the only tobacco-free institution. I couldn't smoke a Newport. And I'm thinking when I get on that van, God, I'm good with West Jefferson, St. Clair, Bibb, Holman, Atmore, all the dungeons just do not send me to Easterland. So the van takes off. There's 12 guys on transfer. We hit Barber County. I'm thinking, all right, there's Ventress, Bullock, and Easterland. Well, the first train we pull up to Ventress, three or four guys get off. I'm thinking, well, there's still Bullock. We pull up to Bullock, two or three guys get off. We pull off, and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to Easterland. So I pull up at Easterling Correctional Facility in 2012, like I said, April 22nd. I go straight into a 30-day lockup cell. No, cig- no cigarettes, no tobacco, no dope. I hadn't been sober since I was 13. Through all my county bids and all my prison bids, never sober. Since I was 13 years old, I always had a toxin in my body. And I get to this camp, and I'm 28 years old. And they put me in lockup, and I could not get high. They let me out of lockup after 31 days. I get into the camp. There's nothing in there but Suboxone. I can't stand Suboxone. I can't stand anything that slows me down. And I didn't know now, but I look back, and as I've become to experience God and walk with God over the last you know, 12 years, I can look back now, and I can see where God started to line my life up. Jesus said no one comes to the Father unless what? He draws them. The fact that you're sitting here, whether you realize it or not, whether you're engaged with God or not, God is drawing you. You wouldn't be sitting in a church yard on a Friday night in the middle of April. There is a drawing. The grace of God is on you. And those of you who may feel God, you may have engaged God, you may not. You may Your mind right now be on your family. It may be on the farthest thing away from God. And the only separation between you and God right now is your mindset. That's why Paul said it has to be renewed. God is just, in, he, he's, he's, I've learned over the last 12 years, God is, is just as close to me, whether I'm doing this, praying for the sick, tithing a thousand dollars, or I'm sitting on a lawnmower or rolling out a roll of sod. God does never change. He's, he, the only thing, he's, he's as close to me as my mind is renewed, right? So I get there, let me get back on the testimony real quick, and I'm going to preach the word and make it legal and all that. I get out of lock up, there's nothing in there that I can do, and so... I maintain sobriety. I get on the weight pile. I gain about 40 pounds in two or three months. I get up to about 220. And I start feeling good about myself, but I'm not saved. I'm just sober. And you guys that's in the program, you know, that first two or three months, you feel real good, right? Because you're sober. Your body's starting to release the toxins. You're in that honeymoon phase, right? So I was there. I was feeling good about myself. I got invited to the chapel one night by a dude. I'll never forget his name. One of the one of my many, you know, God experiences. Jeremiah Boone. Jeremy Boone. He's from Valley, Alabama. And I played basketball with him. And they used to call me Bird. It's tattooed on my arm. And he said, Bird, why don't you come to chapel with me tonight? Now, mind you, I've been in prison for three and a half years. Intravenous drug user, gang member, uh, 24 major disciplinaries in a 19 month span. I have walked back by the prison chapel a thousand times in the last six years. And I would look in there and I would see the old guys. And honestly, in prison, most of the, not, my mind has changed now, but you look in the prison chapel and you think, I'm not going in there, those are the weird guys. And he invited me to chapel. And something in my heart, I didn't know, but something said, yeah, man, I'll come to chapel with you. Based on the, the, the sole factor that he was my friend and he was asking me to go. That's the only reason I went that night. So I go into the chapel, the pastor preaches on whatever he preaches on. I don't have a clue. I really wasn't paying attention. Like some of you now, I was just, not even checked in and so he preaches we're walking back down the the uh, the outside court area and boone's like hey man you coming back tomorrow he had just gotten saved he was kind of zealous for the lord you know how your new friends are when they just get saved and they're zealous and it feels good and they had to suffer for the gospel or nothing yet and so he says you coming back tomorrow and i said i don't know man i might you know go in my dorm room that night i went to look for a book to read and I realized that I was, I was out of my books. I was in between a, a John Gotti, the Teflon Don autobiography, and the Sammy the Bull Gravano, his hitman, hadn't come in yet. That's the kind of books I used to like, you know. And there was this old Battlefield of the Mind book by Joyce Meyer that my mom had sent me four years previous. Now, I don't know how this thing made it through all my transfers and all my lockup sales, but it was in my box and in my bag. And I picked up that Joy, Joyce Meyer Battlefield of the Mind book, and I started reading it. Well, the next day was a Wednesday. I go into the chapel, not with Boone, just walked up in the chapel. I sat down on the far right side, the far back pew, just in case I didn't want to go, I could slide out the door. I didn't want to stay in there. 
And they're showing the passion of Christ. And whatever reason, I sat there and I watched the whole movie. And I'm reading the subtitles. They're speaking in Hebrew and, and Arabic, you know, and I'm having to read the subtitles. And it got to the point where Jesus is literally getting um, the actor, Jim Caviezel, he's getting beaten, you know, they're torturing him and all that. And something inside of me hadn't cried in probably 16 years. I just started crying. Little tears of just this emotional connection when I see with this man on the TV screen, like the notebook. I can watch the notebook now and cry. But I'm just crying for this guy, and, and the movie's sentimental, and it's emotional, and I just start crying. And then in that moment, I started just praying. I'd never prayed. I don't know church, didn't go to church, don't know anything about the Romans Road to Salvation, never been in a program where they teach you about the gospel. Just old intravenous drug user, 28 years old, washed up gang member. And I said, God, if you're real, I'm asking you to help me. And how many times have you prayed a prayer and God didn't answer? You know how many prayers I've prayed? What did you pray to God? Uh, if you give me the center of hope, I'll, 150%, I'll give it to you. I've prayed for girls. I've prayed for the pack not to get hit up by state patrol coming down I-85. I've said so many prayers, and I guarantee you, you've said a thousand prayers they didn't get answered. My son asks me for stuff all the time, and I don't give it to him. You know why I don't give it to him? Because I'm a better father than he is a five-year-old. Amen. The prayers that you don't get answered is because he is a better father than your maturity level to ask the right prayers in that moment. He doesn't, man, I'll kick this thing over. He does not give them to you because he's a better father than what you're asking for. If I had got half the prayers I prayed, I would have died a long time ago. I have nine different kids running around Phoenix City. I loved every girl I was ever with, and I thought everyone I ever loved was going to be the one. Let me tell y'all boys that in the program, I guarantee you, I'll say this on my experience and my faith, she ain't the one. She ain't. You know how many tattoos I got covered up on this arm? You know why? It's the Holy Spirit. It's got tattoos, names on there. She ain't the one, bro. And if she is, God will bring her back. Right. You get your life right. Baby mama, wife, girlfriend, it don't matter. You get right and she'll come back. Amen. And if she don't, she ain't the one. Right. I'm so thankful that God put my, I didn't even see Krista coming. I was dating worship leaders and 30-year-old virgins and pure God girls. And every time I would get into a relationship, this is when I got out, I would look at the girl. One of them was in a relationship for 10 months. I was looking at her one day and God said, you know that ain't your wife. And I said, dang, Lord. <laughs> two, day, two weeks later, I get into another relationship with another girl. These are prophets. These are girls that go to ministry school. Pure girls. Don't drink. Don't sex. Don't watch crazy stuff. Eight months into that relationship, God said, that ain't your wife. And I'm thinking, man, I just, I don't know why I felt. Some of y'all receive that. You get right with him. Read about Leah in the Bible. She wanted the affection of Jacob so bad. And she named every one of her children after Jacob until she got to Judah. And she noticed that she couldn't turn Jacob's gaze from her sister Rachel. She, she said, with this child, I'm going to name him Judah, and I'm going to praise the Lord with him. And her praise to God caused Jacob to look at her so much to the fact that Rachel's not even buried with him. He's buried with Leah and Ramah next to Abraham and Isaac. And I said all that just to say I feel it pulling on me because I, I, I've been where you boys are. Just seek the Lord, bro. Yes. Seek the Lord. You know where the girls find our, their strength? When they look at their man and he's a man of God. Yeah. They're protected by that. And I feel like I'm talking to all y'all over here. I can just feel you. I've been where you are. Girls, you know what's attractive about you? When you're pure. When you're a pure daughter of God. That's, yeah. Yeah. I'll leave that. Amen. Anyway, I walk into the chapel. I say, God, if you're real, help me. If you're real, help me. I'm not asking to get out of prison. I'm just saying, if you're real, help me. I need hope. I wanted some hope. I had been to the end and back with everything that you can have in the world. And I said, God, if you're real, I'm asking you to help change my life. And if you do it, I'll follow you. Right there on the prison pew. Wasn't nobody around. Wasn't nobody praying for me. There was no tongues. There was no hands being laid on me. It was me and the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know how to pray. And I told God as I'm crying, I said, I don't even know if you hear me. I may be losing my mind, but if you can hear me, I'm asking you to help me. I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel nothing. I just prayed in faith. If there's a God and he's real and he's the father of this man, Jesus, that's on this TV, help me. I didn't feel tingles. I didn't see a vision. I felt nothing. But what happened? The evidence of salvation is always going to be sanctification. I get mothers that call me all the time and their, their son's about to get out of prison or he's about to get out of the center of hope. 
He's doing good. Like he's reading his Bible every day. He's sending me letters. He, when I go up there, I'm watching him pray. And I'm like, are you, would you bet your life on it that he's saved? And they go, I don't know. It's hard to tell. And I'm like, no, ma'am, it's not. You will know. The first work of the Holy Spirit is sanctification. He's going to come in and overthrow the old system. Amen. He's going to start working the old system yeah. of manipulation and deception and lying and all the self-hate. He's going to start taking that old system and overthrowing it and revolutionize what's on the inside. My mom, when she came and saw me after I said that prayer that day, she came to visitation and she looked at me for about five seconds. And she got up and ran to the bathroom. I didn't know what she was doing. She came back out and I said, Mom, what's wrong with you? She said, when I, when I sat down and looked in your eyes, the Lord told me he's mine now. I went back to my dorm room that night and this is how I almost lost my mind with Jesus. I say that prayer, I go back to my dorm room for the next probably 48 hours. You know what I could not do? I could not say a cuss word. It's funny. But after you lived the life I did for 28 years, these tattoos, I've never seen the inside of a tattoo parlor. These are all single needle, action, Jolly Rancher, prison tattoos. I cuss worse than a sailor. I made up cuss words. I could not cuss. I could not lie. I could not manipulate. I could not watch Sports Center. I could not watch the late night flicks in prison. I couldn't engage in conversation. I couldn't listen to 105.7 or Foxy 105. There was something on the inside of me that was saying that stuff is... It was death. I could hear death in it. And if it did not add strength to my spirit, I couldn't engage in it. And that was like day two after saying that prayer. And so, unbeknownst to me, I gave my life to the Lord on that prison pew that day, just me and him. What happened, I'm going to get into it right here. The next 19 months, and this is this is for you guys and, and some of you, and I'm going to get into the go with the gospel, Chris. But I feel led just to, you guys that and you women the, if I was on my deathbed right now and you said, Blake, what's your, what's your number one, your best advice or whatever? I would tell you that walking with the Lord takes momentum. It takes momentum. And you need to find a man or a woman of God. If you're a woman, find a woman of God. If you're a man, find a man of God. Somebody that's been somewhere with God that you haven't been. And you pull on that person. And you, you require that they teach you. For 19 months after that point, I sat in that prison under men, very humble. I wouldn't talk unless asked to speak. I wouldn't pray unless they said pray. If they said, hey, we're meeting at the chapel at 930, I pulled up. If they said we're fasting for three days, no food, just water, I tried my best to do it with them. I sat up under those men that taught me how to pray. They taught me how to read the Bible. They taught me what dreams and visions mean. I would wake up with dreams and run and tell them all excited, like, what does this mean? And they would take me straight to scripture. For 19 months, momentum was built. People ask me and Chris, we talk about it all the time. How we, me and Chris say all the time, you know, I'm, I'm not able to get in the word like I used to be when I first got saved. I got two kids, a wife, a business, ministry. We can't spend six to eight hours a day in this anymore. But the years in the beginning where God trained us how to abide in him, we're still running off the leverage and the momentum of that spirit. You guys that are in the program, you maximize your time. You go on fast. You pray. You read the Bible. So I would say, get with somebody that can teach you how to be a man of God. That can hold you to a standard. I remember one day, Jamie Faulkner came and got me and he said, uh, we're going to the chapel. It was like 9.15. I said, okay. So I went to the chapel. Jamie's about this big. He weighs about 112 pounds. Way smaller than I am. He said, we'll be at the chapel at 9.15. Be there. I said, all right, I'll be there, man. Well, about 9, 14, I decided to go to the weight pile and not go to the chapel. He walks up in the middle of the weight pile, some of the biggest dudes in the camp, and he looks up at me and he says, what happened to the chapel at 9, 15? I said, oh, man, I'm, I'm coming, bro. You know, I'm going to get this set in real quick. He said, man, you're a double-minded man. You're unstable in all your ways. And I thought for a minute, the flesh said, what? You know, but then humility and the Holy Spirit said, he's right. You learn how to take correction and humility. That was one of the first things. So salvation from, in my life came like that. And I submitted myself to men of God that could teach me and train me. And I'm still submitted. I'm up under Pastor Curtis over at PMT. Still submitted. Submit to men and women of God. And I'm not saying in a 
in a dictatorship kind of way, but if they can feed you, get it. Amen? So that was my salvation. That's how I got saved, and that's how I maintained momentum in the Spirit. I know how to pray. I know when to go back to the Lord. I know when I get dry. He trains us in those early years how to come back. And you've heard people say this before. It's not going to be the program. It's not going to be your marriage. It's not going to be the job. It's not going to be your kids. It's not going to be any man or woman, even though they can feed you and those things are good for you. They're structure. You learn how to walk with him and you'll always stay with him. Amen. Amen. So now it's kind of transitioning in. I wanted to give you just a, you know, try to be brief on that salvation. But there's that's my come to Jesus salvation. There's many testimonies that I got over the last 12 years. There's testimonies of hope. My wife had cancer last year. Um, stage two breast cancer 2023 was crazy if I don't have the hope of Jesus in my soul I may veer off right people ask us all the time and y'all were strong through that you praise the Lord that's what it looks like to really know him to suffer well with Jesus I got a buddy who's uh, a base uh, he, he played baseball for the Phillies and I played against him in high school he just he just found out two days ago that he's got stage four colon cancer and I was on the on the machine today and I'm riding around and I'm thinking Lord I'm getting to be 40. I'll be 41 next year. If I ever get, if I ever get sick, Lord, you know, and you want to heal me, that's fine. But if you don't, that's fine too. You get to where you know him so much that nothing matters. No suffering, no ups, no downs. It balances out the gospel in your life. The real Jesus will balance out the pure gospel in your life. I got many friends that are way better saints than I have are that die of sickness. And I used to question God. Well, that was a demon or that was whatever. God is sovereign. You get to know him so much that you walk with him. It doesn't matter. Hell or high water, suffering or praise. Like Job said, though you slay me, I'm going to praise you. Twelve years in, I'm at a place now with the Lord. It don't matter what happens. All I can control is my abiding in him daily. That's the only thing I got control over. However, he sees fit to do with Blake. He can do it. What Paul say? There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. Demons, sicknesses, principalities, nothing. Suffering. Multiple testimonies over the last 12 years. I don't have time to go through them. The drug testimony, the hope testimony, the faith testimony, the sonship testimony. About the last six months, I, for the first time in my life, after hearing a thousand sonship messages, six months ago, I stepped into pure sonship. Or God told me it don't matter what you do from this point on, you're mine. Amen. And when he said it, some, something came up off of me. Amen. Because if I got to be honest with you, I used to do this out of performance. Not that you would know I was doing it. But like I would leave from preaching and get in my truck or go home. and Or I would fast and pray leading up into it for days and just, you know, buffet myself. And I felt like the prophets of Baal slashing myself, waiting on God to, you know, answer me or something. I was doing it out of a servant heart. And performance and Jesus said I no longer call you servants I call you what friends You're right imagine the Lord looking at you one day after 10 years 11 and a half years of walking with him and saying boy don't you know you my friend and it just lifted I was about to preach one day and I didn't know what I was gonna get up there and talk about but I've learned two things number one you never get nervous in church and number two when you're a real son you just shoot your shot just shoot your shot on the way over here today, I got the word in me. I'm praying. I'm, I'm not fasting and praying, but I'm praying this week. And I'm pulling up and I got a thousand notes and the Lord sent it to me again. Why don't you go up there and just shoot your shot, son? I got you. All right. Another testimony, sonship. And I want to say it one more time because I know you hear it all the time. Sonship is a revelation. Identity is a revelation. Are you different with him now than before you got saved? But you were always his son, right? Five years ago, they said, you're, you're his son. You'd be like, yeah, but now it has different meaning, don't it? Hallelujah. Amen. One day, something's going to hit you, and that sonship is going to take shape in your heart. By the mercy and the grace of God, you're going to look back 10, 12, 20 years from now, and you're going to realize one thing, that he's never left you nor forsaken you. Amen. Over all the mistakes you've made, Trent, don't matter what you do. Tyler, don't matter what you do. You're his son. Like that one right there walking around, that's somebody's boy. And you go to put your hands on him, whoever the boy is, you're going to find out real quick. Right? We're his people. 
There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. It doesn't matter a backslide or a relapse or a nothing. The only blasphemy, the only sin that's unforgiven is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It took me 11 and a half years to get this. So sonship. The Great Commission. You have to know sonship before going out. The Great Commission. The Ministry of Reconciliation. Does anybody have their Bible? Now we'll make it legal real quick for all the Bible thumpers like me. That boy ain't even shared one scripture yet. Get that boy out of here. I used to be like that. Everything had to be real stern and strong. And if the pastor said a joke during his sermon, I'd get mad, you know. Just religious. Religious. Oh, man, I'm surprised Chris even hung out with me. Probably hung out with him. <laughs> First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, five eleven. The ministry of reconciliation. That's what you've been given. So the great commission, the great to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Matthew twenty eight. Some of you did that today. Some of you going to do it tomorrow. It's the ministry of reconciliation. When you go out here, and I'm going to talk about some multiple ways of evangelism and all that. But all you're doing is you're taking the hand of somebody who may not know God. And you're taking God's hand and you're putting it together. The word reconciliation in the Greek, it means to make an exchange. It's like if I buy something from Mark, we're making an exchange. You are now been entrusted into the ministry of reconciliation. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with preaching. There's multiple ways of evangelism. When I was working at Take the City and directing the, the ministry over there, I had to go into a lot of different denominations, a lot of different races. And I realized real quick that not every church and denomination looks at evangelism the same. We always looked at it like going into the highways and the byways. But what about writing a letter to somebody in jail? What about just being a man of God on a work site and not cussing or losing your attitude? You're evangelizing. You're doing something in the spirit. There's other ways of evangelizing. Uh, there's, there's, my wife works for a corporation and her ways of evangelizing is very different than mine. She can't preach the gospel. There's limits on what they can do. So she has to do it through the goodness of God and the fruits of the Holy Spirit and be long-suffering with people until they, they finally ask her or send her a message and say, hey, what is it about you that's different? There's multiple ways of evangelizing, but the, the key thing is the same. We're reconciling the world back to God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, it says, Know therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're, we're all dead. And that he died for all that which they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. I'm a King James junkie, if y'all can. Y'all follow me on this henceforth and wherefore. There's only one translation. It's the King James. I'm just playing. Y'all read what you want to read. Verse 17. Here it is. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? Y'all know that one, don't you? What about suffer well? You know that one? That's another little joke. Sorry. You will. The more you walk with God, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ instead, be ye reconciled to God. So the ministry of reconciliation. Number one, this is how you do it. If you're not preaching the gospel and going out, you stay pure in the culture that we live in. You know what true purity is in the spirit? It's anything that's void of man's wisdom. Purity goes deeper than the flesh. 
Purity is deeper than not vaping or dipping or drinking or masturbating or listening to crazy music. That's purity of the flesh. That stuff should go away after we receive the Holy Spirit because he's now working in us by the grace of God, the new kingdom overthrowing the old structure that you were born into. You know, your mistakes and your weaknesses, I've said this before, you know that God looks at your weaknesses with you every day? Raise your hand if there's just some things that you do that you don't want to do, but you practice them so it's evident to you that sin is waging war in your members. Raise your hand if there's some stuff you do every day that you don't want to do and you know that it ain't right to do it. You know that when you do that thing, God is standing right there with you looking at it, going, I know, son, I see it. And he's not imputing your sins to you. He's not holding your feet to the fire over it. He's constantly, his grace is constantly working in you to throw out that old system. That's why conviction is there. God cannot condemn you for something that you were born into. He didn't put the old system in you. So the Holy Spirit, he comes in and from the day of salvation, grace starts working to get that thing out of you. That's why God is not imputing their trespasses to them. What did King David say in Psalm 51? And my, and my, my mother birthed me in what? Iniquity. In sin, I was conceived. That's another level of sonship. When you get that revelation, that the thing that you don't want to do, the thing that you know that you shouldn't be doing, God is looking at it with you going, I know, son, I see it. I'm working that thing out of you. Amen. Purity is coming through the Holy Spirit. But true purity is anything that is void of man's wisdom. And in our culture, there's man's wisdom everywhere. The human spirit. I saw LeBron James say the other day, he was, there was something going on, and he said something about, you know, through the human spirit, we will overcome this. And I thought to myself, no, you won't. Yeah. That's culture. That's man's wisdom. True purity in the spirit is anything that is void of our wisdom. It's godly wisdom. It's skillful. It comes from heaven. Staying pure in modern culture is evangelizing. I was on a job site the other day with, with a guy, and he's an operator of heavy machinery, after about three days of being on the job with me, he just pulled up on me at lunch. He said, you know what? I like being around you. And I was like, all right, man, I like, you know, you cool. And he said, man, you just give me, there's something that makes me at ease when I'm around you. You know, the only thing I'm doing different than anybody else on the job, I'm working just as hard as they are, if not harder. But the same talk ain't coming out of my mouth. The same attitude ain't being displayed. I'm evangelizing that guy in that moment. And ain't preached the gospel to him yet. But the Lord's drawing him. Amen. And when the Lord tells me to sow a seed, I'll sow it. Amen. Stay pure in this culture. Maintaining your love walk. Most people, catch this. This is how you maintain your love walk. If you got somebody in front of you, it doesn't matter if they're acting up, if, they're, if their lifestyle is different than yours, and it's tough to love that person, just remember, they're you before you met Jesus. That's all it is. I, I keep that in mind all the time, especially doing ministry. Me and Chris were talking about it. We have to be long suffering. Thousands of dollars. Thousands of miles on car rides taking people here and there and just here and there. And we're, They're just us before we met him. I was that dude before I met Jesus. So you maintain your love walk. That's how you evangelize. Love covers a multitude of sins. And then 2 Timothy talks about repentance. You, you handle people with gentleness and kindness that they may find repentance. Paul told Timothy that. He said, don't quarrel with people. You don't quarrel with people. You don't argue with people. And I'm going to get into the street. He likes it. I'm going to get into the street ministry aspect, but most of us are not every day, 24-7, going to go and preach the gospel. Matter of fact, maybe less than 1% of you in here have, are actually going to have that life. You know why? Because you got bills to pay and you're going to work Monday. You evangelize on so many different levels. You be patient with people. You endure. You use wisdom. You tell Matt, you ain't coming back up in this house. <laughs> wisdom. The goodness of God shown through us is what brings repentance. When you're good to people and you're... Con you know, some of the most profound moments in my life is when people close to me told me no. Right. When I wanted something. Even on this side of Christ. The most powerful word I've ever heard was the word no. People have been good to me and brought about the goodness of God through telling me no. You use wisdom. You tell people no. Bobby Vance. Y'all know Bobby? Bobby's told me no so many times. And it was actually the best thing I needed in that moment. 
But the goodness of God shown through us and the wisdom that we use will bring repentance to people. And the last one on the ministry of reconciliation, personal experience of others experiencing God through you. Think back on those times, uh, especially the ones that are not necessarily believers. I, yes, I preach in churches and yes, I do events and all that. We go to Africa and we go to the jails and the prisons, but I have more God encounters outside those circumstances than I actually do in them. And so you remember the times when people came to you and they say, hey, something that you said or did, it changed my life. Those are evangelizing moments. And I said, I'm, I said all that, and I'm not, you know, not too far from closing. But on the way here, I was thinking, most of these people that are here, they're not in full-time ministry. So we can preach a go and preach the gospel message, but you can't do that all day, every day. You're going to need a practical tool for your tool belt out there in the real world on sharing Jesus. You understand? I was like, Lord, they're, they're not going to be go. They're going to go out this weekend, but they're not going to, you know, I'm going to be at work Monday. So these things, you're reconciling people day in and day out on everything that you do. Your speech, the way you handle yourself, the way you perform under pressure, what you listen to. Amen. Amen. And then number two, continue to draw believers closer through evangelism. So when you, you be apt to teach, you study the word of God. You know, we need to be in season, out of season, ready. That's for when you go out here and preach the gospel, you're preaching to unbelievers mostly. You're trying to reconcile sinners back to Christ through your prayer or a healing or something. But what if when it, what if you're standing or you're sitting in front of a bunch of believers? It's strength, comfort, edification. It's what Paul tells Tim or the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 13, 14, 3. I mean, you need to be studying the word. Curtis told me this a long time ago, my pastor. He said, you're going, only going to go as high in God as your word level goes in God. Reading the Bible. Raise your hand if you know you need to read the Bible more. Maybe listen to worship songs less. Read the Word more. Amen? It's easy. It takes no effort to listen to a worship song. My flesh never gets grieved listening to music. But let me get off in that Word. And you got every distraction in the world. I can't understand it. This. Be ready in season, out of season. This destroys false doctrines. You ever heard somebody say, I'm in a storm? Raise your hand if you said that. You're just going through a storm. I used to have a storm doctrine until I read in Nahum that, that God says, I am the God of the whirlwind. I have my way in the storm. That obliterated the storm doctrine I ever heard. This right here takes care of false doctrines. And if you sit around a lot of preaching, you're going to pick up on a lot of them. That's just what the case is. They, not every man or woman that stands in front of you is given a pure theology or doctrine. Do you understand what I'm saying on that? Amen. you got to let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God vet everything that you hear. I'll stop right there with that because I'll let that one linger a little bit. If I never heard another word preached in my life, if I got this, I'm going to be okay. Amen. 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 Strengthen the inner man by preaching the Word of God to build faith through the testimonies. Faith comes by what? Hearing. 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 So you have a measure of faith right now, right? How do you get more faith? How do you get more faith? Somebody said it. By more word. By the rhema word of God. I got more faith now than I had 12 years ago. Not because miraculous things have happened in my life. Because I've seen miracles and walked off in sin 20 minutes later. I watched a Muslim one time get his whole withered hand touched by Jesus and it healed and he walked away praising Allah. The word of God is what strengthens my faith. You understand what I'm saying on that? The presence of God is good. But I will forget him if I don't have this. I like saying this because it's just a little nugget of wisdom that God used to give me to always stay in this. What does Satan use against Jesus? The word, right? Where was Satan when he fell? So he was in the what? In the presence. <laughs> I can be standing in the presence of God, but if I don't know this, I can be fooled. That makes sense to you? I'm just trying to slowly but surely kind of just like surgically just remove verbiage and stuff that we pick up on that we use. 
that's kind of false bottoms. Am I making sense to you? The Word of God. Anybody that I see that's not in this on a continual, healthy, daily basis. I don't judge what they say, but I know that somewhere in there, they're forming a God in their own mind that they've created or they've heard through somebody else if they don't have this. And I'll, I'll end with that. Anyway, so strengthen the inner man by having the Word of God. And then the last one, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is the Great Commission. And I want to say this to you about the Great Commission, then I'll close. I've... I've done street ministry and, and jail ministry and prison ministry and, and went to Africa and, you know, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Kenya. When it goes to street ministry or evangelizing, you got to go with the grace of God. And what I mean by that is you go when you know you've been told to go. Now, anybody can preach the gospel. Anybody can go out there and smile and love and stand back and pray. But when it comes to being an evangelist or evangelizing a community, you have to have a word from God first. If you're going to really make an impact. A lot of times God tells me when I go into a community, go and be consistent. Be consistent. That means I'm going to, I'm going to sow into that area for a while. So you go with God's grace. I've seen people go out and, and they went, you know, just going out. because That's the right thing to do. But there was no substantial work being done. If you got a word from God, that word of God is ironclad. It will keep you going. You go with God's word. Go with God's grace. And then the last thing. You maintain the momentum in evangelism by continuing to abide in the Lord. You continue to abide in the Lord. So evangelism is pretty simple. Raise your hand if you're not a people person. Like if you can't just naturally pull up on somebody and pray or talk to them. So everybody's good? Mark said, so, so. It's pretty easy if you continue, you know, consistent with it. You just go out there. You keep going. But that's where the consistency happens. Most of the people on 4th Avenue or even down Dove Street around here, they know me because of consistency to go. You just keep going. So tomorrow, I know y'all are going to go out. For those of you who are kind of shy or you're, you're holding back, you don't really know, you know, what to do or say when you go out there, just go. Just go. The gospel's been going forward over 2,000 years without us. It's going to go on whether we go or not. So it lifts off a little burden of fear or whatever. All right? So I'll close with that. I'll close with that. Amen. Come on, Chris. Sorry about that. My camera is connected to my hotspot on my phone and it just sucked all the power out of it. I didn't want to lose the recording, so sorry if I distracted anybody. Well, I want to do a couple couple different things as we close out. Just looking around, I always like to give people an opportunity to respond. Hey, can y'all come up and strum the guitar? Thank you. I always like to give an opportunity to respond to the word. Amen. So if there's anybody here tonight that's never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity in this moment. Anybody here that's never received Jesus 
as a savior. I feel like this is a family talk. I'm looking around at a lot of family. Well, the second thing I want to do, and we'll be available for that. Um, maybe you don't want to come up. Get with, get with me later, or get with Blake, or part of the team later, and we'll pray with you. Amen. The next thing I want to do is I want to pray as we get ready, as he was talking about going out and the different methods we can go out. Um, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, the disciples had already received the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. Jesus breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So then they're having a talk with Jesus and he said to go and wait for the promise of the Father. So they already had the Holy Spirit. They had already received the Holy Spirit. But they hadn't been baptized in the Spirit yet. They had the Spirit within, and John chapter 4 says it springs up like a fountain, but they didn't have the Spirit upon yet. Which Jesus says, when you receive the Spirit upon, He says, and you shall receive power and be my witnesses. Amen? There's a difference in doing witnessing and being a witness. Amen? When you do witnessing, you can, you can do it from a place like Blake was saying, performance, striving. You know, you got the badge. You know, you got the badge. And some of us have even been baptized in the Holy Spirit and we've got the badge. And we, in, that, in our testimony, oh, I got that. I've already got that. But Ephesians 5 says that we're to be to continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things that happens, guys, number one, you receive power. Jesus didn't operate in any signs and miracles until after the Holy Spirit came upon him in Matthew chapter 3. He didn't work any miracles until the Spirit came upon him. Power. The other thing, guys, is boldness. You receive a boldness. Where you used to be afraid to go out and talk to people about Jesus, man, I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, man, you can't help yourself. Amen? And we need that boldness of the Holy Spirit. And there's, there's more, guys. There's more. The Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak and pray with other tongues. I know this is a touchy topic for a lot of people, but I'm going there. I'm going there. You know why? Because Jesus said in Mark 16 in the Great Commission, Matthew 28 and Mark 16 on the Great Commission, He said believers will speak with new tongues. He didn't say super Christians or just the, the select few. He said believers. So this is really important, guys, because there is a place of intimacy that you can reach when the Spirit comes upon you and you enter into that place of that prayer language in your personal prayer closet, there's things that God will begin to reveal and do in your life and speed things up, reveal things. 1 Corinthians 2 kind of lays it out. It says there's things that I hadn't seen. There's things that you hadn't heard. There's things that hadn't even entered into the heart of man. But doesn't stop there it says but the spirit god the spirit of god will make these things known to you see god has a plan for your life brothers and sisters god has a plan for your life and before you were even in your mother's womb the bible says that god knew you and he had a plan for you right i wasn't there when god revealed the plan your mama wasn't there when god revealed the plan your pastor wasn't there when God revealed the plan. But you know who was? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was right there. And now He wants to partner with you. He wants to commune with you. And release that plan inside of you. To a place that it flows out. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 7 verses 38 and 39. He said, in that day, in what day? In that day that we received the Holy Spirit, he said, out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. Have things been stagnant in your life? Has your prayer life been dull or non-existent? Man, I double dog dare you. I double dog dare you. 
to receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. If you've never received it. In Luke 11, Jesus said, all you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. Ask for the Holy Spirit. He's not going to give you a serpent. He's not going to give you a demon. He can't. It's God. All He can give you is holy. All He can give you is Himself. So let's stand up. Let's stand up, guys. So you might say, I've never received this before and I want to receive it. Or you might be saying, this dude's crazy. Or you might be saying, I've received it, but I haven't been flowing in it. And I want to start flowing in it. I've been stagnant. I haven't been going out. I haven't been getting out. I've been walking in fear. I know God's got a plan for me. Hey, listen, I used to think that God was going to sovereignly reveal a plan. No, guys, we've got to pray. We've got to spend time with Him. That's His desire is to spend time with us. And He wants to reveal the deep things of God. Deep cries unto deep. He wants to reveal those things that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard. He wants to reveal those things to us and release those things. And not only does He want to reveal them to us, guys, He wants to empower us to walk in them. Amen? He wants to empower us to walk in them. So tonight, I want to do something. Let's just, let's just do a corporate, let's do a corporate prayer tonight. Let's raise our hands to heaven. The Word of God says if we ask for the Holy Spirit in Luke 11, Jesus said, I will give them to you. And I want to ask tonight, guys, it's just like when you receive salvation. How did you receive salvation? You believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth that Jesus was Lord and then you were saved. And the same way that you receive salvation is the same way that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all want more? Say more, Lord. Say more power, Lord. More power, Lord. More, power. more boldness, Lord. More boldness, Lord. Say, Lord, I want everything you got. So let's pray together tonight. Let's do a corporate prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your Son to live, to die, and to rise from my sins. I thank you that I'm born again, that I'm saved, that my name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, you also said, to ask, to ask and we'll receive. And we'll receive. To, seek, to seek and we'll find. We'll find. To, knock, to knock and it'll be open. You said to remind me of my word. In your word, you said to ask for the Holy Spirit and you will release him to me. That you will baptize me in your Holy Spirit. So tonight, we ask in faith for a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. In Jesus' name. Now let's just begin to thank Him. Let's just begin to thank Him. Just begin to thank Him. God, we just thank You tonight. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit. Thank You for sending Your Son, Jesus. Can we do gratitude again? Sean. Do gratitude again. Let's go out with gratitude, guys. Hey, listen. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Amen. When you get along with God tonight, spend some time with Him. And I believe He wants to release a prayer language inside of you. He wants to release a prayer language inside of you for deeper levels of intimacy. There's things that He wants to do in and through your life that's only going to flow from a place of intimacy. So I want to encourage you guys with that. Amen. Keep pressing in, guys. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. And I guarantee you, you're gonna you're gonna walk in more boldness. You're gonna walk in more courage. You're gonna walk in more revelation. Amen. And you're gonna see miracle signs and wonders done in your life. Amen. Awesome.
I got to keep me Which one of these is for the uh, church? It's about $80 a bottle. It's kind of weak, though. I got a I I this is because I think from his phone he can just. I mean, it's gonna kill his battery. <laughs> Yeah, I'm